Good evening. Welcome to this uh, uh, press conference uh, by Mrs. Stephanie Turco Williams, acting special representative of the Secretary General and head of the United Nations Support Mission in Libya. Um, uh, as, we, as you know, we are holding this press conference at the closure of the meeting of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum. Uh, as usual, Mrs. Williams will uh, address a few introductory remarks uh, uh, followed by a question and answer session. I would like to just uh, make you aware of an innovation for us. Uh, we have uh, a simultaneous uh, interpretation. It's available on your platform for those who are connected online. Uh, it's the last button on your bar below uh, the screen, and when you click on it, you will see you have the possibility to choose original, English, or Arabic. And I would like to thank the interpreters that are with us, and that will allow us to follow this press conference in English and Arabic. So I would like to I have the great pleasure to give the floor to Stephanie Williams for her introductory remarks. Stephanie, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Alessandra, and it's wonderful to see everyone here tonight. And uh, I'm pleased to uh, come to you right after uh, the conclusion of the uh, voting process for the new unified temporary executive uh, authority in Libya. Uh, this was the result of a five day meeting here in Geneva, the members of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum. We went through several stages of voting. There was voting initially for the Presidency Council on Tuesday. None of the candidates reached the 70% uh, threshold for that vote, so we went towards the vote today, um, uh, where there were four lists that were comprised and voted upon. Uh, there were two rounds that were held today. Second round uh, was 50 plus one, uh, and uh, at the end of the at the end of the voting process, we had uh, 73 votes cast. There was one uh, uh, one abstention, but no spoiled votes. And uh, the winning ticket took uh, 39 votes, and uh, the the Presidency Council uh, designate president is. Uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Mr. Muhammad Yunus Al Menifi. Uh, the uh, uh, two other members of the Presidency Council. So Mr. Menifi is from Eastern Libya. The gentleman from the South uh, is Mr. Musa El Koni, uh, and the gentleman from Western Libya is uh, Mr. Abdullah Hussein Alahi. The Prime Minister designate is uh, Mr. Abdullah. Ab Abdul Hamid Mohammed de Bega. Uh, that, so that list took 39 the votes. The runner up uh, list took 34 votes. And the candidates there were for the president, uh, Mr. Aguila Saleh, for a uh, member of the presidency council, and of course, Mr. Aguila Saleh being from Eastern Libya. Member of the Presidency Council, Mr. Osama Jueli from Western uh, Libya, and uh, uh, Mr. Abdul Majid Gaif Saif Nasser from Southern Libya. The uh, prime ministerial candidate for that ticket was uh, Mr. Fatih Bashara. Um, I am uh, very pleased to see already that the candidates who did not succeed. In this, uh, in this race today have, gr have really been issuing very gracious uh, concession um, speeches, tweets, uh, you know, amongst them, Fatih Bashara, Osama Jaweli. We've seen other candidates who, who um, participated in this very diverse process also uh, issuing tweets, welcoming the new uh, presidency council and the prime minister designate. And I think that really captures the spirit of you know, what happened in the room here in Geneva with the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum and, the, and really the spirit um, that is prevailing in, in Libya now as we see progress on the three intra-Libyan tracks that come under the Berlin process. 
I would be remiss if I did not extend my heartfelt thanks to the government of National Accord and to President uh, Fayez Siraj. And uh, you know, uh, we will um, be hopefully speaking with uh, President Siraj uh, later, later this evening. And uh, uh, we are also setting up uh, for the members of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum at 8.30 p.m. a Zoom session with the new uh, Presidency Council and the Prime Minister designate with the members of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum. And this is, and we're gonna broadcast this live as well. As you have seen, we've done a lot of this this week. It's so that this new, temporary, unified executive can listen directly to the Libyans who, many of whom selected them. So, and, and uh, to have an exchange of ideas for the new executive, you know, to, to really um, hear requests of steps that they need to take. There is a lot of work that needs to be done now um, to build on the success of today and looking forward. Um, the, the, the members of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, I'm, you know, very, very pleased that, you know, the, the United Nations could join them in this journey and facilitate this dialogue which has produced these results. Uh, they have a lot of responsibility and moving forward there, you know, as we look at the timeline, because let's be really, really clear, the goal here is national elections. And when I was, you know, last, last here in Geneva, I had a, you know, a very dynamic uh, digital dialogue with about a thousand Libyans and 77% of them said that they want national elections on December 24th of this year. That's what the interim uh, executive needs to focus on first and foremost. What, what we did this week, in addition, of course, to a very, very transparent proceedings where 43 candidates presented directly to the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum members, but it was also watched by, you know, everyone in Libya. My team tells me that there were up to maybe a million views inside. Yes, I mean, a million views total, many hundreds of thousands from inside Libya. As, the, as these candidates you know, presented their programs and took questions and answers. And they were asked directly you know, about to, that they needed to, to adhere and commit to the roadmap set out by the uh, Libyan Political Dialogue Forum and the election.
a problem with the sound. I ask for your indulgence, please, just a few minutes uh, that we can recuperate the sound and we will continue the press conference. And sorry, really sorry for that. It happens. Just one second, please. Okay, well, I'm sure we can... We Sorry can for this. We seem to have the sound back again. Uh, so we will continue and bear with us. Mrs. Williams will try to repeat I the last things she said. I, I believe it was about the need to accept the results. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, we, you know, that was a part of the pledge uh, that uh, the candidates um, signed. And it's on our website. And uh, certainly we have seen very gracious concession speeches and notes of congratulations from, from candidates who participated in this inclusive process. So then I was getting into the timeline. So today starts the 21-day the, uh, clock for the prime minister designate to form uh, his government. Uh, and um, you know, hopefully he does it before 21 days. That takes us to 26th of February. Um, he must, uh, within that 21-day framework or time frame, uh, uh, present uh, the cabinet and the program of the cabinet uh, to the House of Representatives. Uh, they had, in, in their, in turn, they have 21 days. And if you took the maximum calendar, that would take you to the 19th of March. Um, and so we do, you know, call upon the House of Representatives to take the necessary steps to convene the parliament in order to grant you know, full endorsement and confidence uh, to, to this new unified uh, temporary executive. There are some uh, other things that, you know, need to, that need to be done by both the uh, executive and by uh, the, the institutions uh, to meet the timelines that have been set out in the roadmap. Um, but I'm gonna pause here and say one of the key tasks of the new government is, is national reconciliation. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of talk about this in the room today, about you know, the need to uh, build upon the trust and confidence that ha has been developed in the, in the Libyan political dialogue forum. And that would be a key um, duty, responsibility of the Presidency Council uh, particularly with regards to return of uh, IDPs and uh, those who have, uh, you know, had to leave the country for for people to be able to go back home. Um, now, in addition to forming the government, now we have uh, the need to really um, meet the 24 December uh, elections date, and to, and for the government to uh, fully support. Uh, uh, particularly financially, the Higher National Elections Commission, and for the concerned institutions to do the needful on the constitutional arrangements and uh, the sovereign uh, positions of the state. So for the constitutional arrangements, per the roadmap set out in Tunis, the 19th of February is the deadline for the concerned institutions to uh, come forward with uh, the constitutional basis for the holding of elections. It, the 19th of February is also uh, the, the deadline for the House of Representatives and the Higher State Council to come to an agreement on uh, the sovereign positions, um, uh, what, you know, um, they need to avoid uh, is impinging upon the independence of the judiciary. That was set out quite firmly in the, uh, the roadmap in Tunis. The new government must also and this is where the political track starts to, uh, you know, 
uh, relates to and support the other tracks. So we have the security track, we have the military track, which is the implementation of the ceasefire agreement, the five plus five joint military commission are meeting as we speak in CIRT. I uh, spoke to them yesterday and introduced our new UNSNO coordinator, Mr. Ray Zanenga, uh, and we had a nice discussion. And you know, the, so implementation of the ceasefire agreement moving forward on things like opening uh, the coastal road between Abu Ghraib and Sirte, and uh, you know, uh, making sure that the mercenaries and foreign forces uh, depart the country. Will be, a, will be an important responsibility uh, for, the, for the new government uh, and for them to wholeheartedly uh, support the work of the five plus five. Um, on the economic track, there has been a lot of progress really in the last couple of months, but a lot of what we heard uh, this week was, you know, uh, members of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, but also the public wanting to urgently know and hear from these candidates, what are their plans to address um, the economic crisis, the financial crisis, but also the crisis of the living standards for the average Libyan. Namely, you know, the, the fact that the electrical grid needs a total overhaul, otherwise it, it's gonna collapse this summer. The fact that the health infrastructure has been devastated by, by conflict and neglect. Um, the fact that the municipalities are not receiving um, you know, the, the support that they need from the central government. Um, of course, the, the, this was all impacted by the oil blockade, um, but now it is time with the unity government for, you know, and we have for the first time now in, in a couple of really important things have happened. We now have a unified budget for the first time since 2014, and that was the work you know, first and foremost, of uh, living in institutions, uh, the interim government and the government and national court coming together, the central bank involved in that. So you now have your unified budget. You have an agreement to support the budget for the next, uh, for the month of January and the month of February. It will have to carry over in, into the month of March it, until that new, the new government is formed. You know, and this is primarily, you know, to ensure that people you know, receive their salaries in, in this period, and uh, and and uh, that other operations are are supported. We've seen the Central Bank of Libya come together. They've started to have board meetings after something like five years. They've unified the exchange rate, uh, and uh, of course, we're moving for continuing with the financial review of, of the two banks. In addition. There has been a financial review uh, la uh, launched for the Libyan Investment Authority. So um, this is all to say that you know there's there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, the the forum will have a central role in, in in ensuring that this new executive adheres to the timeline that has been set out. They they are going to serve as sort of a check and balance. On, on the new executive, I, they are, I think, very much up to this task. Um, uh, I would also be remiss if I didn't uh, thank the government of Switzerland for hosting the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum. Uh, they have been incredibly generous uh, uh, with us uh, and, um, you know, they really um, enabled us to have um, a sort of a bubble over the hotel where we were conducting the meetings uh, so that the Libyans could uh, have this, this conversation. Uh, and uh, I would also like to thank the government of Italy for uh, providing uh, air transport for, for many of our participants. So um, I started the week by saying, you know, what we have done uh, through this intra-Libyan um, you know, uh, three-track process, which is the, the product of the Berlin process, the conference that was held last year uh, in Berlin on the 19th of January and enshrined in Resolution 2510, is uh, we provide, the international community provided the umbrella for the Libyans to, uh, to talk to each other after many years of, you know, di division, conflict, uh, uh, inst institutional dysfunction, and they are now talking to each other. They are unifying their institutions, 
And I think it is incumbent upon the international community to really validate and get behind the Libyans, listen to the Libyans, reinforce their decisions, um, uh, and, uh, and, and as we have accompanying them on uh, this journey. Uh, and that is a journey that at the end of the road is national elections, 24th of December this year. Uh, and that is really a solemn obligation that everybody needs to work to, to fulfill. I will stop there, Alessandra. Thank you very much. Stephanie, thank you to you and, and your colleagues uh, and everybody who has contributed to this fantastic uh, uh, results. I have a quite long list of questions. I will try to take everybody if time allows, but please allow me to take some people in the room, some people on the platform, some people in Libya, because as uh, uh, Stephanie said, at the end of the day, it's really about the Libyans, so we will try to go to the Libyan journalists in between. Let me start with the room, and I see immediately a request for the floor from Laurent Sierro, the Swiss uh, agency, news agency, Laurent. So yeah. just before we start, I, because we have really a long list of people who want to ask questions, if you can keep your questions a little bit short. Thank you. Laurent. Very good, I'll try that. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, you touched briefly on that, but could you clarify um, in that transitional period which executive powers will be handled by the presidential council and which one will be handled by the, the prime minister and the government? And then briefly, um, how confident are you that the request by the UN Security Council uh, yesterday to deploy rapidly UN observers uh, will put the pressure on the countries which have uh, still mercenaries on the ground in order to withdraw these people. Thank you. I've seen briefer questions, but thank you very much, Laurent. Stephanie. Two-part question, very different uh, angles. So on the difference between the prerogatives of the Presidency Council and the prerogatives of the um, government, um, so this was agreed upon in the meeting in Tunis that was held um, uh, in November. So uh, we have uh, a number of um, prerogatives for the Presidency Council, but it is there are many, many more <laughs> for the Prime Minister. Uh, amongst them are, you know, they do things like they accredit the representatives of uh, foreign states, they appoint and dismiss ambassadors, uh, they are involved in the um, uh, consultations and the formation of the government uh, uh, with regard to the ministers of defense and of foreign affairs. Um, uh, they are, as I said in my remarks, they are responsible for launching this very important, singularly important national reconciliation process. Uh, they um, also uh, carry out the functions of the Supreme Commander of the Libyan Army and declare the state of emergency uh, and take decisions of, of war and peace uh, after consulting with the House of Representatives and the National Defense and Security Council. Um, that's a sort of, you know, uh, overview of what they do. Uh, the government, I mean, I, you can go to our website. I mean, we have all of these documents. It's, it's you know, many, many, many uh, prerogatives uh, with, but, you know, looking at this period in particular, it's a temporary unified executive with, you know, a, hopefully, and, and, you know, this will be, our, I believe, the, um, advice and recommendations of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, that there is a focus on bringing in uh, technocrats, people who um, have uh, experience and expertise, because, you know, really uh, there, there's got to be a focus on the roadmap for elections. There's going to be a focus on the economy, on uh, the budget, the balance sheets, on um, uh, unifying the institutions, um, and, uh, you know, working, working across the divide, we've seen that, we've seen that this week. You saw it really in the building of the lists, where people who really hadn't talked to each other in many years were building coalitions, you know, to, to run for this selection process. And that's really got to continue uh, over the next uh, uh, 11 months or so. Um, again, I would, I would, uh, 
refer you to our website. For, I, I'm not sure I want to read out everything, but uh, again, elections and services and uh, infrastructure repair are gonna, going to be a singular challenge for this government. Uh, your other question, I'm sorry, was on um, on the, yes, on the, the issue of the, the UN observers. Look, uh, this whole process is you know, moving forward. Um, we're not gonna go faster than the Libyans. They're meeting now in Sirte and they're having discussions with our, our UN team who's on the ground, again, about the whole you know, um, uh, issue of, uh, and, and needs for bringing in the observers. Uh, we have always spoken of a, a, a light um, a force. We're not looking at a big force here. Um, but with regard to the issue of the, you know, the departure of the mercenaries, you know that the 90-day uh, deadline has passed in January, but that does not make it an, any less of a legitimate request. This is a Libyan request, uh, and it doesn't make it any less binding on those countries, parties, uh, institutions, organizations that are, that are bringing these people into the country. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, on the platform, the first one to have asked for the floor is EFE, the Spanish agencies. Antonio? Uh, thank you, Alessandra. Uh, Mrs. Williams, I wonder if you can comment on the new leader of the Presidency Council, Mr. Menfi. Do you think he can have enough support from all parties to lead the, the country to democracy? And given that he has a relatively lower uh, political profile compared with other candidates like Aquila Saleh, for example, can this be a challenge for the transition? Thank you very much. Well, I mean, Mr. Menfi uh, uh, and the ticket did, see, you know, did secure the, uh, the the winning number of votes, so that uh, is is an indication of perhaps broader uh, support from him, uh, from him, or for him and for the ticket. Um, uh, look, uh, we're going to have a conversation with him tonight. He had a, a good exchange with the members of the Libyan Dialogue. Uh, forum uh, earlier this week. He answered uh, questions. Uh, he does uh, have experience. He has some diplomatic experience. He was elected in 2012 to the uh, GNC. Um, so, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's got uh, some expertise and uh, important expertise uh, under his belt, and I, I think that that will come into play. We also, of course, have uh, on the Presidency Council Musa El Khoni from the South. He was on the previous, the current Presidency Council for a few years. Uh, he is a distinguished uh, personality in Libya and will, I believe will bring a lot of weight and wisdom uh, to the position. And then the third member is the, he's a, currently a member of parliament uh, from Western Libya, Mr. Abdullah Olafi. So it's, um, I, I think it's a quite a balanced uh, presidency council reflecting the three regions. Uh, and uh, they are gonna have a lot of work to do and it's gonna be important for the presidency council to uh, work smoothly with the, the prime minister and the government and I think, you know, when we see them on the screen tonight, that will also be um, some counsel that will be uh, delivered uh, to this new uh, executive. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephanie Hatton from Bloomberg. Just one second, we are unmuting Hatton. Sorry, just one. I have one question. The new government this is going to be within the uh, NOC and uh, CBL or the previous institutions will continue to work and w to whom will they belong? Is it to the PC or to the new government?
Me dici se vuoi testare. Se bon? Ok, let's go ahead then. Sorry again, I'm really sorry for this. No, I, the question really was about <coughs> the status of the Central Bank of Libya and the National Oil Corporation, the relationship that they will have with the new executive. So, of course, this is all about, you know, the unification of the country's executive, sovereign, security uh, institutions. And uh, that's exactly what we're seeing happen. In fact, it's, it's already happening because the Central Bank of Libya has now started, after a period of five years, holding you know, regular board meetings. Uh, that's very good. That needs to continue. Central Bank is a sovereign institution. Uh, uh, the National Oil Corporation um, is you know, the, the sole legitimate uh, you know, overseer of the, of the country's oil production and, needs, and has remained uh, you know, admirably you know, independent and, uh, and needs to remain so for the good of the Libyan people. Uh, so um, they, of course, all of these institutions need, need to have good relationships with each other. Uh, I, I am very heartened by what we're seeing on the economic track. Uh, the mission, uh, and I'm very proud of the work that the mission has done in this regard. You know, we started with the track two process between the two banks. Uh, the, then it was taken over by the economic track of the Berlin process with support from the international community again, and we had a meeting here in Geneva in December uh, that helped push the process forward, both for the steps that the bank had to take for the unification of the exchange rate, as well as uh, on, on the budget side for those, those talks uh, to proceed. And, and uh, you, know, you know now that the, uh, the National Oil Corporation uh, revenues are being held in a special account. I, I'm confident that moving forward, with the budget arrangements, the consensual budget arrangements that have been made and the unified executive authority, that the revenues can then uh, resume uh, to be uh, uh, deposited in, in the bank's account. Thank you very much, Stephanie. We have Agnès Pedrero from the French News Agency. Yes, hello, good evening. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, uh, listening to the representatives today at the meeting um, gives a sensation that this vote has given some uh, positive momentum. And I wanted to know how much confident you, are you that this momentum will last until December, which is in some 10 months? Thank you. That's a very good question. It's precisely why we, or the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, let's say, um, design the roadmap in such a manner as, as to ensure that um, the, the deadlines and the needed steps in order to realize uh, the elections were laid out very, very clearly, that you don't give the concerned institutions you know, an eternity to do the, uh, the needful with regard to the constitutional basis and the electoral legislation, that if they fail, if they fail in this regard, it will return to the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum because they need, they are listening to the people and the people want elections. And so uh, I am confident because I see the determination amongst the members of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum and that they themselves are wrestling with some of the issues that have impeded progress over the last six years. And they are realizing, you know, there's, uh, that th this is not a black and white, that everyone, you need to meet somewhere in the middle. You have to make historic compromises and concessions. And that, that's what we have seen through this uh, intra-Libyan uh, process. And, and so uh, they are determined to uh, make sure that this you know, temporary executive authority, they don't get too comfortable in their seats and that the, uh, that the elected, uh, the legislative uh, branches do at long last what they need to do to produce the elections and to renew the democratic legitimacy of Libyan institutions. Thank you, Stephanie. Musa Asi, Musa, uh, you are uh, asking the question for which media? Oui, vous m'entendez bien? Attends, vas-y. Moussa, vas-y, tu, oui, tu es connecté. Oui, 
Voilà, c'est bon, c'est bon. Merci, merci Alexandra. Euh, de... Miss Williams, I heard a lot from intervention, a lot of intervention talk about the uh, ensuring departure of mercenaries and foreign interference in the Libyan affairs. And I also heard inter your interventions and the roadmap in Tunis talks about also about the task of uh, ensuring departure of the uh, foreign uh, forces and, uh, and mercenaries. Is, mercenaries. is this a, a realistic demand since the uh, government and executive authority is for a temporary period, a uh, limited period, and they have a big task is to prepare for the election. The second question, what's going to happen to the GNA after the formation of the new executive authority? Thank you. Thank you. I, I believe I've addressed the, the issue of the mercenaries. <coughs> Look, um, you have to listen to the Libyans. They've asked very clearly that these uh, foreign forces and mercenaries must depart the country. I had in my conversation yesterday with the five plus five. They again asked that the international community help them uh, to insist that these forces depart the country and that, you know, all of these um, parties and, and countries fully respect the UN arms embargo. Um, so it's not, as I've always said, it's not rocket science. Those who brought these forces in can take them out. Um, with regard to the, uh, the government of national courts, so the, the, we have the 21, um, 21 day clock now for the formation of the new government, then 21 days for the House of Representatives to do the needful and approve and endorse the new government. In this period, up until the new government is, is, is uh, uh, endorsed, the GNA remains the, um, the, the, the caretaker government, the internationally recognized caretaker government. All parallel institutions will be null and void. So this is, we're moving towards unity here. Um, and uh, I, I fully expect uh, that the uh, GNA, because I know many of them, will work closely with the new executive uh, in, this, in this period of transition. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I would like now to go to one of our uh, colleagues, uh, uh, correspondent in Libya. Um, can we please unmute Adnan, February TV? Miss Stephanie, is this the new government uh, represents all the parties, uh, actors on the ground? And if not, what is the guarantee that its decisions are going to be implemented and applies all to all parties? The question to where is the headquarters going to be for the government and the PC? Uh, the last question, the government, uh, as far as I know, will be located in, in Tripoli, the capital of Libya. Uh, that is, of course, up to the uh, new authorities themselves to determine, but there's no indication that it would be anywhere else. Um, look, we, are, we have built a uh, historically inclusive process here in uh, Geneva, uh, and uh, it is incumbent, just as I asked all of the candidates and the, and the members of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum asked all the candidates to accept the results before today's vote. I asked for the people in the room to accept the results, and they all agreed. Um, this is a moment for historic compromise, for reaching, uh, we've already seen it, people are reaching across the divide. Um, you know, the guarantee is that what you are doing now uh, will, will serve your people and uh, uh, who are waiting, you know, uh, for elections and waiting for, uh, you know, a government that is, that can deliver services across the country uh, for an improvement in the security situation writ large. And particularly, again, I, I, I think in my previous interventions here, I've talked about the importance of Southern Libya, which has been historically so marginalized and deprived. Uh, and this was mentioned uh, today after the vote, the need, uh, the need for the new executive to really step up to the plate and help the people in southern Libya who, um, while living standards elsewhere in Libya are not great, they are really dismal in, in southern Libya. And so 
uh, there's, there's a lot of work for this new executive to do. The expectations are high, but there's also a lot of hope. And there, there's a great deal of a momentum on all of these tracks. The train has left the station. It is also incumbent upon the international community to support the decision that the Libyans have taken today. Thank you very much. Stephanie, back to Geneva, Bayram Altug, Anadol Wansi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for my question, Anadol Agency, Bayram Altug. Um, many people uh, query whether Khalifa Haftar was involved in Geneva peace process and accepted the agreements you reached. Are you in contact with uh, Haftar? If yes, did he agree to abide the whole process? Thank you. Uh, General Haftar is represented at these talks, um, as are many other Libyan parties. Um, he has expressed support to me personally for the uh, political process that is being undertaken uh, by the uh, uh, by the by, uh, by the Berlin process through these intra intra Libyan talks. Um, his representatives in the room today were amongst those who who agreed that they would accept the results of the vote. Thank you, James Bay, Al Jazeera. Hello there, um, Special Rep Deputy Special Representative James Bay is from Al Jazeera UN headquarters in New York. Um, you have got a new government today. You've got an ambitious timeline towards elections. And I know you'll be leaving your job soon, but I'm sure you'll be watching developments closely. What is the thing that worries you most about the next 10 months? What is your biggest worry? Stephanie. I have to say that I'm not, I'm not terribly worried. I'm not overly, overly worried. I think uh, there are a lot of challenges. I think that uh, the new executive will be up to meeting those challenges, uh, provided that they follow the advice and recommendations put forward by the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum to build a government of you know, competent, patriotic Libyans uh, who are not there to divide the cake, but to share the responsibility. Uh, and as I've said, you know, the international community needs to come in quickly uh, and decisively behind this new executive in my Security Council, my last Security Council briefing, I did recommend that the Security Council consider issuing a resolution, uh, which I think will be a very important uh, signal uh, of support. Um, so there, you know, there are challenges. There are things that we are going to have to be vigilant about. Uh, the, and there's going to be a lot of work, both for the United Nations and uh, the countries who are supporting Libya. To, uh, to work closely with this new unified executive. Thank you very much. I'd like to go back to our uh, friends in Libya, Hassan El Bakush, Libya TV channel. Assalamu alaikum. I have two questions to Ms. Williams. The first is, uh, during uh, the sessions of the LPDF, you requested from the candidates for the PC and also for the Prime Minister's office. Disconnected. Uh, to a pledge for the to, to, uh, to, the, to abide by the roadmap and also the uh, election date, and they they have signed these pledges. Can you hear me? Can you please repeat the question? Yes, repeat the question. It's disconnected. 
who during the uh, LPDF sessions you requested the candidates uh, to the PC and also the Prime Minister to present a pledge to abide by the roadmap and the elections date. I want to ask what are the guarantees that Onsmel presents to the Libyan people so that those uh, abide, the new governors uh, abide by the or fulfill uh, their commitments and, uh, and the pledges they presented. The second question is, what is the plan, what's, uh, what is Onsmel's plan with regards to the ob obstructionists who are supposed, who are uh, uh, waiting to, re uh, uh, expected to refuse or reject this decision? Uh, after uh, the thir after the uh, coming of the, of the new envoy, are you going to go back to the deputy SRSG or you are, are you leaving on smell? Well, I was. We were very deliberate, and I have to say, you know, the idea of the pledge was an idea that came from from the members of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum themselves, and uh, so as the facilitators. You know, we, we put this forward both orally, and I, you know, the questions that were asked during the presentations, uh, the Q&As of the 43 candidates were questions that were posed by the Libyans themselves. Um, uh, and so the idea was you get them on camera, <laughs> and you get them in writing, and that, that should be somewhat of a guarantee, you know, at least you can uh, embarrass them if they, uh, if they fail to live up to their obligations. Um, but here's, the, you know, look, we, uh, we are standing behind uh, the, the HNEC, the Higher National Elections Commission. We've had a uh, you know, good uh, support relationship with them since 2012. It's a very, uh, very fine commission. They need, to, they need to be funded. They need to be um, supported to, in order to run elections. And we will uh, make sure that happens. We are grateful that the GNA are, has already come forward uh, last uh, in December with uh, 50 million dinars for the purposes of elections. Um, look, what I see in terms of the momentum is, you know, uh, uh, the obstructionists, the, the status quo, you know, the people who have benefited from the status quo. Um, I, I think that they are moving moving to the margins. They, it bears watching. We, we, we need to be vigilant, and we need to really send signals. I think the international community can play a role here, as they have uh, in, in the past, uh, to hold a, to account those who you know, fail to, uh, to support what is a broadly you know, internationally supported process. Thank you, Stephanie. Ahmad Arun, uh, Emirates News Agency. Can you please unmute, unmute Ahmad? in Arabic. Ms. Stephanie, uh, on the ground, on reality, do you have any concerns with regards to the situation of the Libyan, uh, the LNA after the formation of this government? And if I understood you well and uh, accurately, what is the nature of the support that you have received from Haftar in your conversations with him? Thank you. I did speak to General Hafter last week in advance of the 5 plus 5 Joint Military Commission uh, talks in Sirte, which are being held now, and he expressed his su support for the United Nations facilitated political process and the talks that were set to take place here in Geneva. Um, I, uh, I'm getting you know, a readout from our colleagues on the ground in Sirte, and uh, the, the 5 plus 5 has been welcoming of the formation of this uh, new executive. Okay, just a little bit of housekeeping because we are going towards the end of this press conference. I have Bano Shing Hammer, sorry, 
And then two more, uh, one more journalist from uh, Libya, John Zarokostas, Hussein Niber, and we will close there. So I'll go now to Benno Schwinhammer. Can you introduce yourself in your media, please, sir? Yes, sure. It's Benno Schwinghammer from the German press agency, DPA, um, based in New York. So congratulations on that remarkable development. I would like to ask something about the upcoming uh, observer mission. You said it will be a light force. What does that mean? Is that like more like 10 people, more like 30 people? What is your time frame? When do you think they can be deployed and uh, start working? Um, also, does the EU have any role in uh, providing assets for the mission? Uh, thanks. So, um, as I've said, we're not going to go any faster than the Libyans. I've got, we've got the team on the ground now in Sirte meeting with the 5 plus 5 to go into more detail on the ceasefire monitoring of force. The Libyans are in the lead here. We are, it's, it will be a UN, um, under a UN UNSNO umbrella uh, ceasefire monitoring force. It's going to be scalable. You know, we have the first step now, of the, the opening of the coastal road, which I very much hope happens in the coming days. It will be a, send a great uh, positive signal, particularly after this progress that we've seen here in Geneva with the formation of the new executive. Um, and with regard to, you know, I'm not gonna get into speculating to numbers what, what we're of, 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 of the uh, ceasefire monitoring uh, team, but, uh, you know, what we envision is, you know, not a heavy footprint. So these are civilian, unarmed observers. It's a scalable operation. Uh, there will be an advanced team that will be sent out at some point in the near future to further scope this out. Oh, the EU role. So look, um, the Libyans have made it really clear. Uh, they want this under the umbrella of the United Nations. Um, regional organizations uh, uh, are, are welcome, you know, to send specific na nationalities. The Libyans have a list, frankly, of nationalities that they would not like to see observers from, and it's not no surprise that this coincides directly <laughs> with nationalities of those countries that have interfered directly in the conflict. Um, uh, so they will be looking, you know, uh, for, for uh, observers from other countries. Uh, and, and so that's the umbrella under which it will all come in under the UN umbrella, uh, and, and uh, they will, we and they will assess the candidates uh, as, as they are put forward. Back to Libya, we have Ragda of Al Wazat TV. Ragda. You are on, go ahead. Um, unfortunately, we don't have you, we don't hear you, although you are connected. Can you please try again? I can see you, but uh, no, now I can't see you anymore. <laughs> okay, let, let's try and solve this problem while we go back to Geneva with John Zarocostas. Can you please unmute John? John, you are on, yes, and we'll try to yes, get evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Yes, good evening. Uh, Ms. Williams, I, I, I was uh, intrigued to hear the way you're describing the suffering of the Libyan people. You said some are really in dismal conditions. Um, in that context, is there a way that the UN at the moment can find a way to release some of the frozen assets for humanitarian purposes in Libya right now? That is not the purview of the political mission, so I understand that is, you know, a request uh, for um, of, of the Libyan authorities. It was put forward by the um, by the uh, permanent representative in the um, in the last Security Council uh, briefing. Uh, what I would say is, uh, the UN agencies are on the ground. We're we we're in Libya. We are delivering uh, for the, the Libyan people. Uh, WHO has played a singularly admirable role in helping uh, the Libyan authorities to uh, tackle the, the COVID crisis. 
UNHCR and IOM every day are doing just fantastic and very, very courageous work, the plight of migrants and refugees, UNICEF, you know, so on. I don't, I don't want to leave a particular UN agency out, but we are on the ground. We have been uh, for several years now, and before that, uh, of course, uh, starting in 2012. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Let's try again, Ragda, uh, w, uh, WTV or uh, Albaza TV. Maybe we will manage to have the sound this time. Ragda, can you, you are unmuted. Can you try and speak? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hi, Ms. Stephanie. At the beginning, I would like to ask you about the roadmap in case it was uh, the uh, the uh, 24 December uh, has passed without the elections in Libya. What is the roadmap as then? Uh, another question about the role of the five plus five. Uh, uh, after the formation of the government, uh, uh, and an, an, a third question, if you can answer this, uh, is the issue of the national reconciliation as well of the upcoming files. Will you have a role with the upcoming uh, government with this regard? Thank you, Rafa. I'll take the first bit of the question, uh, the last bit first, which is on national reconciliation. So yes, this is a task for the Presidency Council specifically outlined in the roadmap. There was a suggestion in the room today after the vote uh, from one of the senior shiuch from uh, Eastern Libya that uh, the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum assist in this effort by forming a, a committee from with, within the dialogue uh, that would provide recommendations for the Presidency Council, and I think that's an excellent suggestion. Uh, formally, the uh, African Union, uh, as a product of the Berlin process, um, has the, the role to organize a national reconciliation conference with, of course, the assistance of the United Nations. We will be there to, to, to provide our assistance to the African Union. The work uh, has begun on that, and I'm sure we'll proceed apace. Uh, on the issue of the five plus five, you know, it, it continues. I mean, these, these guys are working. They're in their seventh meeting. Um, I th everything was now sort of going to go apace as, as the institutions uh, uh, move towards uh, more integration and unification. Look, I think the 24th December National Elections Date is quite doable in Libya. So uh, it's laid out in the roadmap. It's supported by an uh, overwhelming majority of uh, Libyan citizens. So again, the onus right now is on the institutions to produce the necessary basis uh, for elections, whether it's a constitutional basis or the electoral, uh, uh, frame, electoral legislative uh, framework. But at the end of the day, it's, it's baked into the, the, the roadmap process is that it will come back to the members of the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum if the institutions fail to meet the deadlines that have been set out. And we end up with uh, Hussein Naiba, Al Arabiya. Hussein. Uh, um. uh, what is your What is your plan to help stop the arbitrary and the unlawful detention in Libya? and to stop the torture being practiced in some uh, prisons. Uh, more generally, what is your plan to protect uh, the human rights and to stop its violations? Thank you. Even another ايضا موجود في خطه في خارطه طريق هو التزام الجاد بمبادئ حقوق الانسان ومره اخرى they received several questions on the issue of um, uh, adhering to human rights principles uh, committing to uh, accountability the need for accountability which is, is is desperately required in libya and committing also to uh, the principle of uh, transitional justice. Again, I mean, you know, we need to hold them, to the, their feet to the fire. Uh, there is, there is a, a crisis of a lack of accountability in, in uh, 
In Libya, there are many illegal detention centers, whether for migrants or, in, or indeed there are illegal prisons that are run by armed groups. All of this needs uh, to stop. Uh, there are many, many people who have been deta detained for, for too many years uh, illegally uh, and against all uh, principles. There is a you know, culture of uh, uh, torture and abuse. Um, these are all, you know, the challenges, n not only for this new executive authority, uh, uh, but also uh, as Libya continues on this journey to really building um, unified, strong, and accountable institutions. Stephanie, if you allow me, Jamie Keaton thought he had his hand up, but uh, he wasn't, but now he is. Can you take the last question from Jamie? Go ahead, Jamie, Ke Jamie Keaton, AP. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Thank you, Alessandra. Um, Ms. Williams, thank you very much. Um, two things. You mentioned to my colleague James Bays about uh, the need for the international community to uh, react quickly. Have you had any expressions of any, any interest? There are a lot of countries that have, have, have activities in Libya, and I'm thinking of Russia, Turkey, Chad, you mentioned, and nine countries I think you've mentioned to me that may have forces in the country. What expressions have you had today since these elect this, this vote has come down from those countries? And then a second quick, very housekeeping question. Will the executive authority members who were chosen today be eligible to run in the elections at the end of the year? On the last uh, bit of the question, uh, no, no, they're not uh, eligible to run for elections. That's stipulated in the roadmap. Uh, in terms of, I'm, I'm sorry, I've been, I've been going flat out since we did the vote, so I'm not tracking uh, statements and whatnot, but I'm, I'm confident that the international community, because I've uh, heard uh, directly in, in the run-up to this uh, selection process that uh, whether from the Security Council or from uh, important member states, that they will um, get squarely behind uh, this Libyan process. Um, thank you very much, Stephanie. Jean has maybe one last question from a Libyan uh, media that could not get through. I don't know if, Jean, you want to read the question for Stephanie, and then we will close. Okay, let's, sorry. There was a question from Al Marsad. Uh, uh, will the new executive authority require a, a, new, a new UN resolution from the Security Council similar to resolution 2259 uh, to be internationally recognized, legitimized? That was certainly my recommendation to the uh, members of the Security Council. Of course, one must defer to them on, you know, that's the, their decision to take, but it, it was is highly recommended. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, to everybody. We come to the close of this uh, press conference. I know we have already said goodbye to Stephanie once. <laughs> we will say it to her again. And we take this opportunity to thank her for the fantastic work that she and her team has been conducting this weekend, of course, to all the participants for their uh, fantastic participation and, uh, and conclusions. You may want to have the final word. Yes, no, thank you, Alessandra, as always, for the great support of, uh, from your team and others here in Geneva. I would say just to note that I, I am transitioning out. <laughs> Uh, and Mr. Kubish, who is the incoming uh, special envoy, is actually here in Geneva. We've been doing a very nice and comprehensive uh, handover, and uh, I, I wish him and the entire, there's, a, there's an entire new UNSMO leadership team, uh, all of the best, and uh, they, will, they have a great team that they are inheriting uh, from, from the old team moving out, and uh, of course, I also have to, uh, you know, uh, give great credit here to the former SRS chief Hassan Salama, who designed this uh, the three track this Berlin process that we have been now been we have taken it up and it uh, it is uh, going forward. So thank you all very much and take care. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and all the best to you for the pour la suite. Thank you very much to everybody. Have a nice weekend and good night.